Yama, Yama, hello, welcome. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us this evening for a very special lecture for the Chow Chakling Museum, Being Collected, Aboriginal Objects in the British Museum with Dr. Gay Skullthorpe. And at the top, I'd like to let everyone know there is a hearing loop in the room if you'd like to sit near the front. The lecture tonight is also being recorded and subtitles will be provided for release with the footage in the coming weeks. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Marika Duchinsky. I'm a Gomoroi and Manandangi woman. Uh, and uh, I've recently joined the Chachakwing Museum as newly appointed curator of Indigenous heritage. To formally begin uh, this evening's proceedings, I'd like to introduce Uncle Alan Murray from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, who will welcome us to the tree. Thank you, Uncle Alan. Also, Yama. Um, good evening. My name is Alan Murray. I'm also the chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Land Council, and I was just explaining um, to Gay uh, about the things that we do um, in terms of the Land Council. But before I do that, um, I want you to get an appreciation um, of the size of our Land Council. It stretches from the south. Down, down to the Georges River, to Bankstown, then up towards to the north, over the Sydney Harbour Bridge, over to Palm Beach, uh, to, to the Hawkesbury, and to the west, to the Nepean. Uh, but our boundaries uh, fall short of Parramatta, just, just on the other side of Homebush. So from, from there to south, to the north, to the west, there are something like in the order of uh, 16 clans that make up the Aurora Nation. However, from the eastern coast, say from Elizabeth Bay all the way to the Blue Mountains, there are 29 clans that make up the Aurora Nation. The mob out west say they are a nation within a nation, and I won't say who they are but some will say what they are and they believe that they're a nation amongst the nations. So, but the Metropolitan Local Land Council has the responsibility of caring of something like 26 cleans of the Euro Nation, whereby there are no direct descendants. And as you can see, colonisation has been impacted here in Sydney. Here in Sydney alone that there are only two particular clans that say they can trace their lineage all the way before them tall ships they came through Botany Bay in Sydney Harbour. They're the, the Gadigal people and the Bidjigal people. And most of them Bidjigal people live at the La Perouse community. It's important to reflect that myself, I've lived in Sydney all my life. My parents lived there. My mum's from Walburn. She's a Gamaro woman from Pilica. My father's from Kamraganja Mission on the, on the greatest river in the system. It's called the Murray River. And the Murray River is actually at a point where our creator, the army, is crying for us to the point he's causing a lot of floods. And that's how we believe in our relationship between, between the Creator and also to the, to the land. But when he cries for us, or he or she cries, but he cries for us because there's been abundantly a lot of Aboriginal deaths or Torres Strait Islander deaths in our community. And as you can see, it's now starting to renew. We're getting better clear, clear days to the point that Yes, let's move on, let's get life going, let's move forward and so forth. With the Metropolitan Local Land Council, we have, we've had uh, burial sites here in Sydney and we don't go out and, and, and say where they are, but we do get a collection, we do find skeletal remains and it proves to us 
and it proves to me that Aboriginal people, particularly here in Sydney, whether it's the, the Garrigal people, the Camaragal people, the Wongal people, and even the Gadigal and Bidjigal people, we are finding evidence of their occupation here in Sydney. And we know that for a fact that with the two families, or the two clans, they can trace their lineage. And it's really important to reflect that. I want to acknowledge um, Pellegrin, who was a Gadigal woman. And also I want to acknowledge uh, Bangaroo, also an Aboriginal woman who spoke and had dined with the governors at, at the time, and to make sure that we ha had a dialogue during early occupation of Sydney. And also I want to acknowledge uh, Kami J. Um, Perkins, and I can't say his first name, but he, there's a plaque here on Sydney um, on the university campus. With that, and I'll say this, is that I've done a lot of work in the countries. Normally it starts with a smoking ceremony. We ask you to walk through the smoke in order to be cleansed. There are different properties for smoking ceremony. When, it, when an Aboriginal child is born, we smoke the child to the land. And when a smoke is again lit, it signifies that we are here as a group. And if someone wants to come in from another estate or from another country to come into our country, we will light the, the smoke to say, you can come into our country. But this was different. This was different when the tall ships came in. Smokes were lit up in Port Botany, Sydney Harbour, to say invaders are coming to, into our country. And just sort of imagine little canoes, we call them Nawis, canoes going up, up and down the Sydney Harbour to say, and they're lighting this name, be aware invaders are coming into this country. And that's how we see it. And that's how we see it to that point, is that when I see you, I see you strangers, and I'm hoping to leave as a, as a friend. And one of those things about being in, in, in the relationship or friendship, we can share with you that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been in this country for 40,000 years to the point that we know how to live off the land, to the point we can show you how you can use the land to benefit yourselves. And we certainly want to pass on the legacy, and this legacy is this, is that if you don't do the right thing by protecting the land, the land's not going to protect yourself. But if you want your children to live another generation after another generation after generation and beat our legacy, that means you're going to be here for more than 40,000 years, 60,000 years. And we certainly want to make changes with the, uh, all the challenges with the policies about looking after, looking after Australia, looking after the environment. And we'll certainly walk with you if you make it happen for us, and that is through, through the Illawarra Statement from the Heart and through a constitutional change, through a referendum, because we can give you the voice, and that's how we understand it. So I say this, I want to pay respects to the Gadigal elders, past, present and emerging, their elders, and also I would like to acknowledge the Bidjigal people of the Euro Nation as well, and certainly I want to acknowledge my parents because they've lived here. I'm a King George's baby. I've only sent up the road there that where I was born, but certainly I pay respects to my parents. With that, I've been a chairperson for, for, for a long time. I'm looking for another handout, and that is I want to pass it on to another young person who can take the tools, take the responsibility, and then move our cause forward. And that is Aboriginal protection, culture and heritage, culture and heritage that can show that, yes, you can live in Australia. With that, listen to, to Gay with your presentation. I, I know it's going to be brilliant. I'm learning. In the next week or so, we're sending our team or our board uh, over to Germany to repatriate. We continue to repatriate our our countrymen overseas and to bring them back. We don't know who they are, but we will give them the honour of respect to say, yes, you, we will bring you back 
And before we take them back, we'll have a ceremony. And that ceremony will start with a smoking ceremony. And we will collect all the items that they would live at the time, looking at the bush, and take back the leaves, take it back to soil, so that when they are gathered and bound in possum, they will come back to our country. With that, have a great evening. Take the advice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uncle Alan. Um, thank you so much for your warm welcome. It is honestly nothing short of a privilege to be welcomed onto this land, onto Gadigal country. I too acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people whose clan lands encompass the University of Sydney campus on which the Chowchak Wing Museum now stands. I acknowledge the ongoing connection of Gadigal people to the lands, waters and skies that surround us. I always remind myself that I am a visitor to this unceded land, land which only holds me now because of all those who have cared for it since time immemorial. Being Collected is the Chow Chakwing Museum's annual lecture series, which acknowledges and celebrates the unique perspectives of curatorship from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Amazingly, Being Collected is now in its 16th year. It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Dr. Gay Scalthorpe is a Palawa woman from Luchawita, Tasmania currently working at Deakin University as Research Professor, Cultural Heritage and Museum Studies in the Alfred Deakin Institute of Citizenship and Globalization. She took up this position in August 2022 after working for almost 10 years as a curator and section head Oceania in the Department of Africa, Oceania and the Americas at the British Museum. Prior to working in London, Gay worked in Australia as a member of the National Native Title Tribunal and at Museums Victoria, Melbourne. Anyone who has followed Gay's vital work with Aboriginal collections in museums and most recently at the British Museum will, I'm sure, be anticipating tonight's lecture just as much as I am. And we are extraordinarily grateful to Gay for being here tonight to deliver the Being Collected Lecture for 2022. Please know that there will be time for a Q&A after tonight's lecture, so please save your questions until that time. And we also invite everyone in attendance this evening to join us for some food and drinks with Gay at our reception immediately following the lecture. And now, would you please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Gay Sculthorpe. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Alan, for your really warm welcome and the wise words that you've left us to think about tonight and with that understanding of the place where we're meeting today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people and all the peoples of the Eora Nation and other First Nations people here tonight. I'd also like to thank the Chalchak Wing for giving me this opportunity to speak and for all of you who've come along this morning. Um, before I get started, I would just like to give a quick personal reflection in that I was a museum studies student here at Sydney University in 1977. So, so if ever there are any, if there are any young students here and wondering what uh, your career is ahead of you, uh, you don't imagine what can happen to you. So certainly when 1977, someone was talking about the British Museum, I just thought, I just couldn't, you know, I could not have conceived then that I'd have the job of working as curator at the British Museum and being here as a professor of museum studies tonight. Um, and the knowledge I've gained along the way is through my community and the Aboriginal people I've worked with and many, many museum and university colleagues. Um, before I formally begin, I'd just like to say, although I use the word object and collected, I do so only for reasons of brevity, 
recognising that objects are cultural materials of enormous meaning and value, and that the word collected covers a range of acquisition methods, including being stolen, gifted, exchanged, and purchased. In 1909, historical geographer Ida Lee wrote in the Sydney Mail and New South Wales Advertiser that, and I quote, the early history of New South Wales is one long story of pioneering, and it can be studied with no greater pleasure than at the British Museum. During her visit to see the exhibits, she noted that the relics from Port Jackson are probably the most ancient in the collection, and that a small box made of bark and shaped like a canoe was originally the work box of a female of New South Wales. She also noted a label with the words New Holland and was told by a museum attendant um, that the objects derived from the collection of Lord Valentia. She thought that, and I quote again, in all probability, these curios were brought to England from Australia by some of the early, earliest colonists and they may have once been the property of the blacks who lived in Sydney in the days of Governor Phillip. Setting aside Lee's disregard for Aboriginal presence, her memories of her museum visit, in hindsight, reminds us that objects once known in museum collections can be forgotten and need to be resurrected anew, and that archival and museum links between Australia and the United Kingdom remain significant to scholarship, as well as critical for access for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Ida Lee was born in 1865 in Kelso, near Bathurst, but during a visit to England in 1891, she married an Englishman and lived there till her death in 1943. In 1906, she authored the book, The Coming of the British to Australia, which was featured in the article I referred to above. While she lived in the UK, Ida Lee visited not only the British Museum, but also the Admiralty and she transcribed many early journals relating to Australia, such as correspondence from Joseph Banks to Ellen Cunningham, and many of her notebooks and correspondence are held by the State Library of New South Wales. The objects that Lee noted on display in the British Museum in about 1906, it would seem uh, remain largely forgotten or unremarked upon until the 1960s, when British-born Australian archeologist Vincent McGaw learnt what the museum attended knew in 1906, that they came from Arley Castle, Staffordshire, the home of Lord Valentia, who became the second Earl Mount Norris. Despite extensive correspondence with museum curators, librarians and archivists, McGaw was unable to find a link between Arley Castle and Australia, but he noted the objects appeared to relate to the period before 1820 and were some of the earliest Aboriginal items collected from Australia. In the last few years, PhD Daniel, uh, student Daniel Simpson, who's here with us tonight from London, and myself have been able to trace more of this history um, back to early naval voyages, of which I'll speak more of shortly. This drawing is one of over 400 held by the Natural History Museum in London, known collectively as the First Fleet Collection, which comprises several parts, some from the Port Jackson painter, which were part of the Joseph Banks bequest in 1827, drawings by Thomas Watling, purchased in 1902, and drawings by George Raper, held in private hands, donated in 1962. Many people here will be familiar with these drawings as they're often re reproduced in publications about early Sydney. Yet there is much we don't know about them, such as where they were drawn, how did they reach England, and with the objects drawn in sight in Sydney or from objects taken to England, and do any of those objects still exist? And if so, where are they now? My talk this evening aims to give a brief insight into how a large Aboriginal collection was amassed in the British Museum in the 1800s, focusing on Aboriginal objects from New South Wales and some of the key participants in the process. Little of this collecting was due to systematic efforts, but was rather a series of serendipitous events until the later 1800s. I will briefly firstly outline the changing organized, organizational structure within the museum uh, during the 19th century, which influenced the development of the collections. 
I will then turn to some of the earliest collectors of material from Australia and then illustrate more specifically the pathways of some individual objects from New South Wales which arrived in London. In the final section, I will talk briefly about recent and ongoing projects to begin to make these uh, collections better known and accessible here, and will finish with some comments about where collections belong and responsibilities for them. Throughout, I hope to illustrate some of the difficulties as well as the potential for productive work in researching these objects, which is necessary to try and understand to which communities they may relate, as well as highlight issues for museums and policy making in repatriation and related matters. So firstly, uh, what was happening in the British Museum? Well, what is now the British Museum is quite different to the museum of the early 19th century. Um, the museum was founded in 1753 with the diverse collections of, the, uh, of Dr. Hans Sloan. And the collections grew so big in subsequent de decades that the natural history department in particular grew so large it was moved to South Kensington in the 1880s to eventually become the Natural History Museum. The museum library was always a central function of the museum and included the Sloan Library as well as the Library of King George III. It moved from an earlier location to Bloomsbury in 1823 and in 1857 the famed Round Reading Room opened and it became the centrepiece of the museum's great court when it was redesigned and opened in 2000. And much of the library, unrelated directly to the museum collections, became the British Library in 1973 and moved to a separate building at St Pancras. At the time of the first acquisitions from Australia, there was no subject then known as ethnography, and Aboriginal objects formed part of the Department of Natural History and Curiosities. There are only a handful of objects recorded as having been acquired from Australia until 1839, when Samuel Talbot donated a collection of 90 objects from the Swan River Colony. Edmund Smee donated arrows from the Torres Strait, and Major Thomas Mitchell donated a small collection of objects um, from New South Wales, including this string bag from the Darling River. This is not to say that there weren't other Aboriginal objects at the Museum from Australia much earlier than the 1830s, as although a South Seas room was established in 1775 to display objects brought back by Cook and others, in the early 1800s, the so-called artificial curiosities were not particularly val valued and relegated to the basement, and they were given uh, little attention until a revamp of the South Seas room in the early 1800s. Scholar Edward, Edwin Rose has noted that before 1820, the museum had little funding to actively pursue acquisitions and had to rely on donations such as from trustee and collector Joseph Banks, whose income and annual expenditure was far greater than that of the whole British Museum. Consequently, the museum collections remained, as it, uh, Rose has said, relatively insignificant and only began to gain precedence and state backing from the mid-19th century. In 1836, Aboriginal and other Indigenous objects, what would later be termed ethnographic, were transferred to the Department of Antiquities, where they remained until 1866, when Augustus Wollaston Franks became the keeper of the new Department of British and Medieval Antiquities and Ethnography, and it wasn't until 1946 that a separate ethnography department was established. Uh, eventually, the ethnography department um, became known as the Museum of Mankind and was housed in another building in London, but it came back to the Bloomsbury site in about 2000. Um, and so what all this history means, that for anyone who's interested in studying collections, is that tracing objects and histories involves working in several different British Museum departmental archives the British Museum Central Archives, the British Library, as well as those archives which moved out with the natural history collections, as well as other archives in London and the UK. During the 19th century, there were three key people in London associated with the museum who had a major influence on the acquisition of items from Australia. Joseph Banks, Augustus Wollaston Franks, and Henry Christie. 
Firstly, Joseph Banks, in his role as president of the Royal Society until his death in 1820, was an ex officio trustee of the museum, and objects often moved back and forth from his house in Soho Square to the museum. Although Banks donated many natural history specimens, um, the registers don't indicate he gave any Aboriginal objects, but records from those days aren't really great. Banks was certainly an influential collector, and uh, he sought many items of natural history, human remains, and other objects from Australia. With the formation of Haslar Hospital Naval Museum, which was part of the Navy Medical Department of the Royal Navy, uh, it was founded near Gosport in 1827, many Aboriginal objects collected during early naval voyages were posited, deposited there while the British Museum languished. A parliamentary inquiry into the British Museum in 1835 perceived the British Museum and its collections as a poor relation of the museum at Haslar. Objects from Australia donated to Haslar uh, included ones from Western Australia collected by naval surgeon Alexander Colley in the 1830s. But with the collections of Haslar becoming overcrowded, in 1855, the Admiralty decided to close the museum and transferred many of the objects to the British Museum. Uh, from 1851, when Franks was appointed assistant keeper, he expanded the collections enormously, notably through the donation of the personal collection of Quaker Henry Christie, who also gave a bequest to establish the Christie Fund to purchase objects for the collections from, uh, for decades to come. Thus, from the uh, 1860s, uh, there existed two different registration systems within the museum, the Christie Collection and the main museum registration system, which makes all the museum uh, numbering systems really confusing. So while correspondence for many, ex uh, for many of the donors to the British Museum exists for the British Museum Collection, there are more limited records to understand how Christie acquired many of his objects from Australia, although we know so some came from the 1862 London exhibition. So from looking at people and pull factors in London to what was collected here on Australian shores. And to understand what was collected from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people here, one needs to look beyond uh, to objects beyond existing in collections to archival and historic records describing object collections which may not have survived or yet been located in collections. Some naval uh, accounts clearly described acts of thefts by naval personnel. For example, during Philip Parker King's surveying voyage on the coast of Northwest Australia in 1821, when Warora people speared the ship's surgeon, Dr. Montgomery, in retribution, naval personnel took spears, spear points and other objects to punish those people involved and to, in the hope of deterring such in future such occurrences. This stone point was acquired by Franks from the United Services Museum in 1873, but that museum was a place where King had also do donated objects in the early 1830s. And this spear point appears to match one described and illustrated in King's published voyage account. Yet in other instances, as Daniel uh, Simpson has shown, there were also instances where stolen objects were returned to their owners before the ships left Australian shores. For example, in 1802, Matthew Flinders ordered Aboriginal fishing nets collected by his crew to be returned to people at Port Curtis in Queensland, perhaps feeling some remorse after noted that um, Robert Brown's thieving of nets on Fraser Island from Butchler people would ha have deprived them of their livelihood. The notebooks and diary of Robert Gale, a ship's surgeon on HMS Rattlesnake in the 1840s, were bought just a few years ago at auction by the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich. They contain a list of what Gale collected on the northern Australian coasts, which weren't known in other collections from that voyage held in the British Museum elsewhere. In 2017, through noting a misspelling of Gale's name in the records of Worcester Museum, I was able to identify some of the original objects Gale collected on the Rattlesnake Voyage, which are now in the Worcester Museum collections, such as this basket from Cape York, which was mislabeled not only to collector, but also to the place of collection. 
in tracing these histories, it's important to note that the day an object is given, the date, uh, is not necessarily when they were collected. So you do have to look at later records to understand um, the history and that objects often pass through several hands or museums before reaching the British Museum. For example, as noted above, Vincent McGaw had noted in the 1990s that early Sydney objects, such as this uh, spear from Port Jackson, had come from Arley Castle in Staffordshire. But it's only been through our recent research that we've come to know how those objects were obtained um, for Lord Valentia. His um, godson was Frederick Bedwall, a midshipman on Philip Parker King's surveying voyages around Australia during the years 1818 to 1821, on which Bungaree travelled on some of those voyages. Uh, Frederick Bedwell is probably less well known in Australia than the other midshipman on the voyage, John Septimus Rowe, who became the first Surveyor General of Western Australia. Bedwell later returned to live in Australia in a house he named Valentia Lodge at Paterson. While King's collecting in Western Australia has been described in detail in Tiffany Shellam's book, Meeting the Whalo, Aboriginal Encounters in the Archipelago, Less well known is collecting undertaken on these voyages while the ship stopped in Sydney. For example, the letters of John Septimus Rowe from Sydney on the 5th of November 1817 describe the corroboree he saw performed by Kissing Point people when Aboriginal people sought refuge in a house he was at during a thunderstorm. So Rowe and Bedwell thus had many opportunities to collect artefacts from Sydney as well as other locations on the Australian coasts. Objects from King's voyages were taken back to Britain and most appear to have been sent initially to the Roveal Museum at Newbury, run by Rowe's father, the Reverend Rowe, whose collections were auctioned after his death in 1843. From the arrival of the objects in Newbury, they appear to have been then sent to Mount Norris at Arley Castle, and after Mount Norris died, they were auctioned in 1853, with the, some objects being purchased by the Christie Collection thus eventually coming to the British Museum in the 1860s. Among the objects from Arley Castle labelled as um, Port Jackson at the British Museum are several spears, two string bags and a boomerang. This striped boomerang looks remarkably similar to one in a drawing done by the Port Jackson painter. Beyond the British Museum, objects from Sydney and New South Wales have been identified in other museum collections in the UK such as in the Pitt Rivers Museum, which has a club arguably, but not con conclusively, once belonging to Bungaree. And there are several boomerangs donated by John Kingdon Cleave of Bungarabi Homestead near Blackstown. Um, the Pitt Rivers Museum also has a rare curved club from what's just termed Australia, but it's, it's of the form distinct to New South Wales, which came from a little understood collection known as the Ramsden Collection, donated in 1877. We now believe this club may have come from the missionary Reverend Alan Gardner, founder of the Patagonian Mission, who visited Australia between 1820 and 21 and had some interactions with Aboriginal people and opportunities to collect. The Economic Botany Collection at Kew Gardens has a club from the Hunter Valley collected by the Reverend Richard George Bootle, who arrived at Musselbrook in 1848, and Ulster Museum Belfast has a large collection of weapons from New South Wales, mainly clubs amassed by Henry Cavendish Butler, who was an assistant surveyor under Major Thomas Mitchell. Butler was born in Sydney in 1811, but was sent back to England to be educated at Addiscombe Academy and came back to live in Australia in about 1829 and lived here for about 11 years. And in, in between about 1839 to 1841, he spent some months at the property of St Helia's in the Hunter Valley, where his relative Sophia Dumaresque lived. And a descendant of Butler's donated the collection to Ulster Museum in 1951. Aboriginal objects in the UK are also found distributed ancestrally, that is, in places where collectors came from or were educated. For example, National Museum Scotland has weapons from New South Wales collected in the early 1820s by Sir Thomas Brisbane, an early governor, and Sheffield Museum has weapons also collected in the 1820s by lay teacher George Bennett, who donated them to the Sheffield Literary 
and Philosophical Society in the 1830s, and they remain in Sheffield Museum today. So I'm now going to tra trace the history of some individual objects and their pathways to Britain. And knowing where objects were made or used is uh, the first step in being able to connect them with the right community here. But few objects from early New South Wales in UK collections do have specific places of collection recorded. An exception, of course, being the spears taken in 1770 at Camay, Botany Bay, on the Endeavour voyage, as normally at MIA Cambridge, but exhibited here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum recently. And the difficulty in tracing these object histories is evident in a couple of examples I'm going to show you. This narrow powering shield at the bottom was purchased by the museum from Lieutenant Augustus Merrick in 1878, having come from the collection of his grandfather, the armourist Sir Samuel Rush Merrick, a great collector. Some Australian objects can be seen in illustrations by Merrick published in a book in 1830. In an earlier handwritten catalogue put together in 1815, uh, Merrick appears to note that he had acquired these objects from Colonel Francis Robson sometime before the latter's death in 1807. And you can see in the middle of the illustration at right what might be this shield. Colonel Robson had been stationed at, um, as Lieutenant Governor for some years on the island of St Helena in the Atlantic. On the 17th of May, 1789, Robson and his wife held a dinner to entertain Arthur Bowes Smith, a surgeon on the First Fleet, during a brief stopover on his return to London on the Lady Penrith. Smith's journal records his invitation to dine with a then Major Robson and noted, he, and this is a quote um, from um, Smith. He says, the major is a great virtuosi and has without exception the first private collection of natural curiosities I ever saw, which I was very happy to increase by some few articles I possess and which he thought worth his acceptance and for which I received other curiosities in return. Uh, Arthur Bo Smith certainly collected some Aboriginal objects. His diary of the 21st of January, 1788, noted, Upon our landing, seven or eight of the natives came up close, close to us. They were all provided with lances of a great length, pointed with a bone of a stingray at one end and a piece of oyster shell at the other, grown or rubbed to a fine edge, and one of them had a heavy bludgeon, which I persuaded him to exchange with me for a looking glass. So could this powering shield be a rare example of a surviving First Fleet objects? Merrick catalogue has a detailed catalogue entry saying, and I quote again, a scimitar and shield, both made of wood, the latter of curious construction from New South Wales. As the shield, when held in the hand, presents an angle to the antagonist, a skillful manager of it, can parry any blows made at him with great dexterity. The only object currently confirmed as associated with the First Fleet is a club fashioned into a whip collected by Commander David Blackburn of HMS Sirius, which is now in the South Australian Museum. Uh, that's the uh, drawing of Santa Elena done by Arthur Bo Smith when he visited on his way back in 1789, which is held in the State Library of New South Wales. Um, this overall wooden shield probably looks more familiar to you since its association with James Cook has been asserted and discussed at some length in various media. Its material of red mangrove does not grow in Sydney, so it has been suggested that it was traded down through Aboriginal pathways from northern New South Wales where red mangrove grows. However, if it was not collected by Cook, but after the colony of Port Jackson was founded, its path to Sydney and London could have taken a different path, such as possibly by ship from northern New South Wales to Sydney, where it may have been amongst the many shipments of objects recorded as being sent back from the colony between 1790 and 1820. The mention of a wooden shield on display in the South Seas Room at the British Museum in 1817 suggests that it likely appeared on display about then, 
as earlier annual descriptions of the museum displays did not describe it. It may have come into the collection via Joseph Banks, who lived near the museum, and it could have been sent to him or given to him by one of, of his many New Holland correspondents, such as the botanist jo George Cayley, who came to London with Daniel Mowatton in about 1810 to work on Banks's collection. Another shield with stylistic similarities to shields from the Sydney region is this one, purchased by the museum in 1908 as a group of Australian weapons being sold by Miss Emily Budden. She had worked for the London agent of George Fife Angus and his son George French Angus. The latter spent time in Sydney in 1946 and visited Camp Cove where he met Aboriginal people. Many of the objects in the Angus donation in 1908 had been labelled South Australia, which is closely associated with the Angus family. But a closer look at the shape and decoration of this shield clearly indicates the style of shield found in the Greater Sydney region. This shell uh, fish hook and the spear uh, are from, was acquired in 1926, and um, it's one of four shell fish hooks. These had previously been described um, until 2021 as coming from Tahiti in the museum records. But when a German specialist in oceanic fish hooks uh, commented on a visit that they were not Tahitian and possibly Australian, um, uh, archeo since then archeologist Paul Irish is working on our project about these early objects has noted that these are seemingly the only New South Wales shell fish hook surviving with lines still attached, uh, which makes them disorder. And so they're just incredibly special. So the fact that they, these come probably from Port Stephens was only became known through the search of the records and checking things in 2021. The fish hooks were donated to the museum by Sir Frederick Sidney Parry in 1926. His father was Sir William Parry, the commissioner of the AA Company, who, with his wife, Lady Isabel Parry, lived near Port Stephens from about 1829 to 34. Lady Parry sketched some of the objects she collected, which she sent home in a Maori canoe to her family home at Alderley. Research by student Eleanor Foster of ANU and currently in Cambridge ascertained through accessing Lady Parry's correspondence at the Scott Polar Research Institute at Cambridge that Lady Parry acquired uh, fish hooks um, by exchanges with Aboriginal people who wanted to get metal ones in exchange. Um, this uh, fishing net was donated in 1911 to the museum by, it just had simply Mrs. J. MacDonald Lanark of Sinclair Road, West Kensington, London. Uh, so who was she? So I found out she was born at Castle Forbes near Singleton in 1831, her father uh, had property, John Lanark, had property in the Hunter Valley and lived at Rosemount. Uh, in 1861, uh, Mrs. Lanark married James MacDonald Lanark at Singleton, who for a period owned Southgate Station on the Clarence River, and they later lived in Melbourne. Her letter to the museum described this object, and I quote, a small fishing net made by the natives of New South Wales from the bark of the Corridrum tree uh, before Captain Cook's time. While unlikely as old as before Cook, it certainly indicates that the net dates from the first half of the 19th century and is thus a rare surviving fishing net likely collected in the Hunter Valley where the family lived, but there's no written documentation to confirm this. As noted earlier, this is a really, this is a unique object. Um, a work box described as being used by an Aboriginal woman, an Aboriginal woman. It's made of folded bark with tight ends and contains a piece of sinew, some cord and a double pointed wooden pin. The Christie Collection Register described it as a work box of an Aboriginal female. It was one of three objects donated to Royal Kew Gardens in 1857, where it was noted as being from New Holland. The donor was Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward, who is known as the inventor of the Wardian case, uh, which was he developed to transport live plants over long distances at sea. 
It was transferred from Kew Gardens to the British Museum in 1872. Ward did not visit Australia, but it had many correspondents here. And you can see how much it looks like in shape to the Nawi, the canoes of coastal New South Wales. Uh, Major Thomas Mitchell, referred to earlier, is of course well known for his surveying and all the places named after him. Uh, he also donated this club, which was illustrated in his book, Three Expeditions into the Interior of Australia, published in 1839. But the uh, book gives no indication for where or for whom it was obtained. And it was actually registered as coming from South Australia, but due to the similarity of uh, other shields from coastal New South Wales, I believe it's also a really early uh, coastal New South Wales club. Uh, in 1928, a group of stone tools from Botany Bay was bequeathed by Archibald Liversidge, who some of you here might know, was a professor of mineralogy at the University of Sydney. He described and illustrated them in an article published in 1894, where he said, and I quote, most of the implements from San Susi and Bondi were obtained by me from the few blacks who some 20 years ago uh, used to camp at these places. So he acquired these directly from Aboriginal people. Some objects from New South Wales in the British Museum and other collections were collected by various contributors for the many international uh, exhibitions held. New South Wales exhibited few objects at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, but more were sent to the big exposition in Paris in 1855 and later exhibitions such as the 1862 London Exhibition. Uh, this drawing by Lila Hawkins Waterhouse can confirm at least some objects um, remain in the British Museum collections. So this is one of about 70 drawings of objects exhibited at the 1862 exhibition that uh, Waterhouse drew. And you can see one of the objects still, there are two of these shields in the British Museum. So records of how objects were disposed of from the New South Wales Court of the Exhibition when it ended show various ways how objects were disposed of. Some that belong to the SS Cowper, secretary to the New South Wales Commission of the Exhibition, were returned to him. Objects contributed by Miss MacArthur were returned to J. MacArthur Esquire. And various objects, including shields displayed by Henry Moss, a prominent figure in the Shoalhaven district, and Mr. Herbert, Ernest Herborn of the Maclay River, were sold after the exhibition for one pound and 10 shillings. The two shields are still from Henry Moss in the British Museum, are strikingly akin to shields described by James Backhouse, like the one here during visits to the Shoalhaven River in, in 1836. And they have, uh, on the back, they have white hand stencils. They're really remarkable. Other donors to the collection in the second half of the 19th century typically donated only one or two objects. For example, Josiah Cato was a London-based collector active in the British Archaeological Association during the 1860s. He donated three Aboriginal objects to the collection in 1868, including this shield. But unusually, this shield has the name of the maker or owner and place of association, which was recorded as Bobby of Tinani, near Taree. It seems unlikely uh, Cato visited Australia, so how he acquired it can only be speculated perhaps acquiring it from one of the various dealers and auction houses selling such objects in London in the late 1800s. Another collector and donor born in Sydney in 1835 was George Salting, donated this club, some of you might know of him. Um, this club was described in the register as, quote, made by a native of New South Wales, but it forms, it seems very, it's a very elaborately carved. Salting was educated at, he was born here in 1835, but educated at Eton and returned to Australia and graduated from the University of Sydney in 1857. He inherited much wealth and devoted most of his life to building a personal collection, spending about £30,000 a year for all his life. Much of his collection was bequeathed to the British Museum, the V&A Museum in London, and painted, he gave his paintings to the National Gallery, 
and his house and contents in Hampstead were bequeathed to the National Trust. Doctors, um, either on naval voyages or later temporary residents or visitors, were often collectors, such as this club from New South Wales, uh, which was sold to the Christie Collection in the late 1800s by Dr Richard Gullett Whitfield, who worked at Sir Thomas's Hospital in London. Uh, but he also had a sort of private museum in Alexandra Palace in North London in the 1870s. This held stuffed animals, skeletons, savage, so-called savage weapons, foreign costumes, medals, flowers, and so on. And the natural history objects from his collection were acquired by the Natural History Museum. So um, it's relevant to note that apart from Aboriginal made objects, the British Museum collections contain a range of other material such as photographs, historic drawings, prints, coins, banknotes, and contemporary prints and drawings from New South Wales and Australia. Just to show, just to name uh, just a few, they include those Aboriginal portraits from New South Wales and Victoria and Tasmania by John Skinner Prout, which were acquired from the auction of the estate of craniologist Joseph Barnard Davis in 1883. Davis had purchased these from the artist in London in 1855. Uh, there are portraits by Charles Rodius of Aboriginal people from New South Wales, purchased from a J. Clarkson in 1840, and drawings of Aboriginal people by J. W. Lewin, which were given by Sir Richard Owen in 1893. These two unsigned, unsigned drawings, similarly done after Joseph Swabby Tetley in the early 1800s, were purchased by the British Museum in 1864. Um, the vendor's initial letter to the BM in 1964 said that he had recently noted two early watercolour drawings amongst, amongst his family archives, which appear to have some ethnological interest. He thought they had been drawn, and I quote, on the spot by some artist accompanying some expedition. Um, and on the reverse sides are pencil notes um, and mentioning the word Port Jackson. Uh, these were among the family papers of J. Tillotson Hyde, a former member of staff of the uh, museum. How he acquired them is not known. So just some reflections. When I arrived at the British Museum in uh, 2013, I was fortunately positioned in that the museum had just begun uh, research projects with colleagues at the Australian National University and the National Museum of Australia. This was one of four projects funded by the Australian Research Council I was engaged with over my 10 years in London. All these projects have been trying in various ways to make known and more accessible Aboriginal collections in the UK and Ireland. The projects brought various Indigenous artists and research fellows to London and produced a number of books and associated exhibitions. Uh, these included, in 2015, Indigenous Australia, Enduring Civilisation, at the National Museum of Australia, Encounters, Revealing Stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Objects in the British Museum, and in 2016-17, um, Yulman Makara Mia Budja, uh, which was uh, involved lending objects um, to Albany. And there's another project that's still ongoing, Collecting the West, How Collections Made Western Australia. So the Encounters exhibition involved the loan of about 150 objects from the British Museum to Canberra, where they were displayed alongside contemporary works from the various communities represented. The National Museum of Australia and British Museum staff did many visits to about 28 different communities to talk about the objects and the exhibitions and related issues. The Albany exhibition, Yulman, was important as a response to Aboriginal community members from there saying to the British Museum, it's no good sending objects from their country to Canberra. They wanted to see them locally in Albany. Through cooperation with the Western Australian Museum and local business supporters, 16 objects were then subsequently lent in a locally curated exhibition, which was supported by a lively public program events for the broader community of Albany. The Albany Aboriginal Her Reference Group is continuing to work with UK institutions, including National Museum Scotland and the Natural History Museum through a project led by Tiffany Shellam at Deakin University. It is looking at a collection of dried fish specimens and drawings of fish collected by local commissariat officer Robert Neal, who was in Albany in the 1840s. Um, 
The dried fish specimens are in Edinburgh, and you can, in some of them you still see the spear holes. And many of the drawings of the fish have their Noongar names recorded, which is really important in a revival of Noongar language today. And very recently, on the 30th of September, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery opened an exhibition, Taipani Melatina II, which includes objects lent from various UK museums, which have not been seen since their removal over 150 years ago, including a rare kelp water container displayed in the Great Exhibition in London in 1851 from the British Museum. And they've borrowed objects from World Museum Liverpool, National Museums of Scotland, Pitt Rivers Museum, the BNA, and Derbyshire Record Office. And another object from the Musée de Quai Bromley in Paris, a kelp water container collected by La Biardière at Research Bay in Tasmania in 1792, will arrive in Hobart shortly to join that exhibition. So working with the La Perouse community here in Sydney, uh, a current ARC-funded research project led by Maria Nugent at ANU, he's here tonight, which involves the British Museum and MAA Cambridge, has been trying to find objects from Sydney and coastal New South Wales in British collections. A large number of objects from this broad region have been located in various collections across the UK and Ireland. These have largely been identified on stylistic grounds, not by specific documentation, and by personal visits to collections to see them. So going back to the, this uh, first fleet drawing I showed you, you can see how uh, such drawings can be used to identify unidentified objects in museum collections. The next step in the project is to try and bring a number of objects from various collections in Britain to Sydney next year for community research and exhibition. These various projects would not have been done without the work of Australian colleagues who worked hard to obtain various research uh, grants and the communities who have supported the work. Over the last 10 years, awareness of these collections in both countries has greatly improved not just through loans, but through individual study visits to Britain and the response of local museums who wish to engage more with Australian communities and have started to do so. This map shows the distribution in the UK and Ireland of objects from Australia. Our project has estimated that there are about 39,000 objects from Australia in the UK and Ireland spread across 70 institutions. But of these 39,000, about 15,000 are stone tools from Tas Tas Tasmania collected by Ernest Westlake in the early 1900s. So what are some of the current issues and future challenges for Aboriginal communities and museums in dealing with all these materials? I'm sure you are thinking, why is it proposed that certain objects are only proposed to come on loan and not permanently returned? Uh, firstly, this is the quickest way for communities who have associations with objects in overseas collections to see those objects, save for the few people who may be able to travel and view them in overseas collections. Secondly, current legislation for national museums in Britain, not local museums, makes it difficult to remove objects from collections permanently, although proposed new legislation is envisaging some change with that. Loans, however, are not an easy option, even in the last few years with COVID, staff shortages, cost of materials and freight, uh, and export and import fees have you know, almost tripled. The Yulmont exhibition was supported by the Western Australian Museum, and costs were reduced by shipping those crates with a larger container of objects going on loan to the Western Australian Museum for another exhibition which had entry fees. So large paying exhibitions such as an exhibition with, say, works by Picasso or Art of Ancient Greece, recoup the cost of borrowing through visitors having to pay an entrance fee to see the works on display. But this would be unconscionable for Aboriginal works on loan, so new sol solutions are needed to help defray loan costs. Uh, while I understand uh, and I support that many um, objects be repatriated to Australia, I think this needs to proceed carefully uh, to allow full uh, consideration of information and issues. So while it is easy for people to demand that objects should be returned now, it is not always easy to identify to whom they should be returned. 
Few of the objects in overseas collection have a precise place of collection documented, as I mentioned earlier. Some of the objects we have identified are only known to be from general areas, such as Sydney or coastal New South Wales. And uh, even though particular objects, such as those acquired by Henry Cavendish, Cavendish Butler, who spent time at St Helens in Hunter Valley, he also travelled overland through Gundagai to Port Phillip. So we need to be careful in ascribing where objects from his collection originally come from. Thus, it may take time for museum and relevant community parties to understand and confirm to which community any object should be repatriated to. Communities across a broad region may need to think about where responsibility should lie for objects identified only to that region, such as coastal New South Wales or Hunter Valley or even Sydney or New South Wales. Museum records are also full of errors that need to be verified and much more research needs to be done to identify objects and collections where they, to understand where they come from. And unless collections are digitised, it is really difficult to understand what is held in a collection, even in Australia, unless personal visits are made. Further, if communities wish to maintain repat repatriated objects, not just for current generations, the current generation, but for future generation, there is the issue of how can facilities be developed and maintained and staffed to do this. I know that from time to time, state or other museums may act as a collection repository for some returned objects, but in my view, few of the state museums have sufficient resources and space to document and care for the collections they already house without taking on responsibilities for any additional collections. Security, record keeping, building, maintenance and staffing costs are considerable and need to be considered. Across Australia, a number of keeping places and cultural centres have um, been established, but you know, even some decades later, have had to be rescued from the hands of financial administrators. So I ask the question, what new models and relationships are required to make repatriation sustainable in a way that suits the aspirations of Aboriginal parties? Looking across Australia, and perhaps I'm not well informed since I've recently returned, there appears to be little coordination or considered national policies for documentation and support of Aboriginal cultural collections. Responsibilities are split in Canberra between agencies responsible for funding return of ancestral remains and secret sacred objects within Australia and those for permanent return of cultural objects from overseas. There are goals outlined in the Australian Museum and Art Galleries Association's roadmap, um, including developing a national inventory for cultural materials for collections. But who is coordinating or resourcing this work? Cultural materials from any region can be found in museums across a number of states. For example, objects from Sydney are held in Melbourne Museum. But there is little digitisation of collections to easily locate these within Australia. And it is often easier to locate museums materials held abroad. This work of identification and inventories is really important as, in my experience, Aboriginal community wish firstly to be able to easily locate where their cultural material is now. There also seems to be competition between the states and territories to build national centres for the display of Aboriginal culture, yet existing state and national museums are often under-resourced with ever-decreasing budget and money is needed for ongoing operating, staffing and other infrastructure, not just for building construction. The state government in Victoria worked recently with Wurundjeri people to buy a drawing and shield by William Barrack being auctioned in the United States. Are any public institutions buying significant Aboriginal objects that are being auctioned from time to time in Sydney, such as this club? Was this bought by any public institution? Someone here might be able to tell me. Uh, in my talk, to sum up, I've only given a brief overview of the history of the collections from Australia in the British Museum, touching a little on collections held in other museums in the UK. I have not dealt with collecting from all regions or later time periods, concentrating on uh, New South Wales in the 19th century. For those wanting to know more, I would recommend this book, these books. As well, there's a very recent great book published by Le Leah Louis Chavez on mask histories about the turtle shell masks 
uh, in the British Museum and other museums, recently published by the University of Sydney Press. That's a brilliant book. Um, as a Palawa woman working at the British Museum for almost 10 years, a key cur curatorial goal was to improve the documentation of the Australian collections in my care through adding information to the database and working in tandem with colleagues in the UK and Australia to look at ways in which information objects could be made more accessible to communities here. This was achieved in part with bringing Indigenous artists and research fellows to London, the exhibi exhibitions produced and objects linked to exhibitions in Australia and through the various publications uh, supported by the Australian Research Council. But I know there is still much more work to be done. While the phrase, uh, stuff the British stole, is an intention-grabbing headline, in my view, it does little to address the needs of communities when it comes to issues of repatriation. It is not just stolen objects that people may want back today. It may be objects that were traded freely, but which now have different meanings and values. To me, what is important is the interests of relevant communities today, irrespective of how objects were acquired. Each object and community is unique and affected by difficult historical circumstances. People may want information, objects, or an ongoing relationship with a museum, such as, for example, to assist with research. The one generalisation I would make about what needs to be done is to listen to what Aboriginal people have to say about their own cultural materials. While the United Kingdom and Australia have been working towards a free trade agreement, what if there was a binational accord between the UK and Australia for jointly funded projects to promote bilateral exchanges, repatriation and other projects for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander material held in UK collections? This might lead to more Aboriginal art and culture being seen in the UK and more support for access, loans or repatriation of material back to Australia. Perhaps this could be an important job for the ambassador for First Nations that Minister Wong has recently advertised for expressions of interest. Uh, my impression is that in the post-COVID era, there remain structural and political impediments to coherent national policies and programs for Aboriginal cultural collections. And I'm not particularly optimistic about Commonwealth state cooperation. I don't have the answers, but I think it's good to start with knowing a bit more about collections, understanding what research needs to be done, and beginning to imagine possibilities and outcomes that communities wish to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Gay, that was fantastic. Um, Amazing, Dudley, thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing with us your research around the collections of the British Museum, some of the challenges involved in undertaking this work, challenges that we as museum curators continue to face, and you've raised a lot of important questions around meaningful community access and repatriation today. Um, that's a lot to chew on. Um, so I'd actually like to open it up to the floor, um, as I'm sure there will be some questions. So please do pop your hand up if you have a question for Gay, um, and I do ask that you can, if you can speak into the microphone, please, um, so that we can hear your question on the recording. Who has a question? Thank you, Gay. That was very interesting. Uh, and I'm interested to know that Maria Nugent's here tonight because um, you co-wrote a paper, a number of papers, about the um, so-called Gwagel Shield. And I note what you've written, and that it may not necessarily be from 1770, but you've both acknowledged that it's probably the earliest surviving uh, shield uh, belonging to the Indigenous people of Australia. And my question is this. In the time that you were at the British Museum, and I'm not seeking to... Uh, find, uh, get you to divulge confidential information. What was the pressure on your uh, group, on, on your department, to maintain the line, so to speak, about the Gweagle Shield, which after all is housed from the last time I've seen it in a cabinet in the so-called Enlightenment Room of the British Museum. Uh, one would argue that it's 
out of context and I, heartened by the comments you just made about uh, exchanges in the future between uh, the United Kingdom and Australia in terms of bilateral exchanges, because that's something that's close to my heart because of my interest in another major repatriation issue being the Parthenon sculptures. Um, and you've also touched on the problem with the British Museum Act and the fact that it prohibits the accessioning of objects. So, my, my, and, and given that, and I'm sorry, it's a bit rambling, but just recently, uh, only in the last week or so, you would have seen that the rotating Conservative government is now putting the mocker on any proposed changes to the Charities Act, which was seen as a possible way of overcoming the statutory prohibition on the accessioning um, objects so that that status quo will remain. How do you see something like the Gweagle Shield coming back in a way that represents a win-win for both the local Indigenous population, people who are generally interested in the cultural history of our First Peoples, but also ensuring that there are reciprocal loans going back to Britain so that the British Museum can also display objects that would attract um, uh, researchers and interest generally. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, comments there. Sorry. Um, so, in, I think you began with the British Museum line. Yes. Uh, well, the British Museum has, as you know, uh, its legislation which does prohibit certain objects being removed from the collection, except in rare circumstances. But um, the British Museum does acknowledge that the shield is a very significant object. And like all um, knowledge, information about it continues to evolve. And I think more information as possible will come to light. But whether or not it was collected by Cork, it is probably the earliest object from Australia, but the other shield that I showed tonight, um, that could be, it's also very early. So that could be the oldest shield in Britain. Um, so the British Museum doesn't particularly have a line, but it's very happy to engage with party to discuss these issues within its operating terms. But I think your broader question is about cultural cooperation and exchanges. Um, well, if you take the example of ancestral remains, um, there was a time when legislation in Britain did not allow that to happen, similar to the legislation the British Museum has at the moment. And it was actually through Prime Minister John Howard and um, Tony Blair having discussions in the late 1990s and a commission uh, set up, chaired by him, Professor Norman Palmer, to look at the whole question of human remains in Britain that led to the Human Tissue Act in 2004, and then subsequent to that, the British Museum did repatriate human remains to Tasmania and some remains to New Zealand. So I think it's a matter of cultural ministers, Commonwealth governments, other parties having these discussions. I mean, I'm sure there are you know, lots of politically savvy people who are good at these things. I'm a curator and do, do the research, but I think um, you know, it's just I'm just putting out there that these a bilateral exchanges would be a terrific way to go. I just wanted to ask about um, the British Museum. I have how many times have they asked uh, Indigenous Australians to come to them and give talks or give information to the public? Uh, about the objects that are from their ancestors. So the, as opposed to repatriating everything to Australia, what about uh, getting Indigenous Australians to broaden the knowledge of people in the United Kingdom so that they it comes straight from the uh, descendants rather than from people in Britain? Is there, is there any movement to do that? Uh, uh, there are exhibitions on a particular area, such as Indigenous Australia in 2015. Um, there were Aboriginal speakers involved in those discussions, and there were some funds to bring people over to do that. The public programs... <laughs> 
Uh, well, the British Museum has lots of people who visit and give uh, maybe talks to staff and other interactions, but the public program, like most exhibitions, are normally programmed in association with the current temporary exhibitions. Any other questions for Gay? And can you distinguish between uh, the object and the image? Importance to uh, the broader community of actually having to see the object or in this digital age being satisfied with high quality images of the object. I'm just interested in the distinction between the object and the image. Um, it's certainly much better if people can see the objects. That's why the goal has been to try and have more objects come out here on loan in the short term. But um, you've probably seen the various quality, quality images of objects. Um, and this is a freshly taken shot, but others I showed which is a snapshot. So um, the fact that people can look, Google the British Museum collection online, you can download a spreadsheet of all the Aboriginal collections. Um, and you can see um, the images that are available. I think that's a really good starting point. And high quality um, photography can occur uh, on request. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I was just wondering on a more personal level, when you first went to work at the British Museum, what surprised you most about um, perhaps the attitudes uh, in, in Britain about Indigenous collections such as you were responsible for? I think in 2013, I think there's been a change in the last um, 10 years, but in 2013, I think people and museums, I wouldn't say museums, that the general British public weren't particularly aware of their colonial heritage. And if they thought colonial, it meant India or Africa, and it didn't mean Australia. And I think that's still very often the case today. And um, it's interesting, when we were doing the Indigenous Australia exhibition in 2015, we had some focus groups and we tried to ask, what, would people be interested in coming to see this exhibition? And uh, a comment that one uh, gentleman made was, um, I wouldn't want to pay to come and see an exhibition that told me how badly my uh, country treated other people. Uh, you certainly uh, opened my eyes with the present presentation and obviously um, the, the point is any sacred objects needs to be returned. It doesn't need to be stated doesn't need to be publicly stated. The Guru Shield is a very important artifact. It will, um, it's meant to, meant to unite rather than deflate the whole situation. And at, at, at no means we were defeated. It was taken as a souvenir from these shores over there. Do the British people get it? that this country was populated? Do they get it, that this country was populated by Aboriginal people who had their own system of control and protection of its environment, understanding law and governance and all that? Do they get it? Do they get it? Or do we have to go over there and put a flag on their shores? I think a lot of people in there don't get it, and a lot of people here don't get it either. Yeah. But, but the, 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 those, those objects but are really important and there's a need for them to be returned. The, it's, it's, sometimes when I sit there and I'm just wondering, pondering as to why, are we still part of the Conley? And I always wonder and I think if the decision making has been made, it's obviously done for a purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Alan. <laughs> um, I think we have time for just one more question, so thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. I think that uh, the objects that you have 
I presented, reveal the uh, culture, tradition, and custom. My personal question is that how you know you you became so interested in collecting these things? What make made you so interested in it? Why was I interested in tracing the history? Yes, yeah, yes. because even though this my talk may have been a lot about particular collectors. Um, and it's not the collectors who are the most important, of course. They're not the people who made them. But it, it is often the collectors who can help us trace back uh, to the right community about um, the, who need to be involved in these discussions. Because often those collections have records or documentation or letters uh, that can help understand where they come from. Because in many cases, written records um, may be the only way to know that. I think we have just one more question, just one more, but you look very eager to ask it, so I'm, I'm going to let you. Um, I was just wondering, like I know there's the legislation that stops the repatriation of the objects, but did the people in the British Museum, like the management or the people you were working with, do they view that the uh, objects should come back to Australia? Like, do they see that? as their rightful place? Well, I guess it, the staff are very sympathetic to the um, views of Aboriginal people and the other Indigenous people with which we all work for. And within the limits of the legislation, staff go to as many lengths as possible to try and encourage access and availability. But it's the trustees of the museum who are representative of British society who make decisions about these matters. And as staff, I think one of our roles is trying to also help to educate the managers and the trustees. And, I, I, and um, there was some of that that, that, that does go on. Sorry, I didn't get it. Well, there's 25 different trustees, so I really can't speak for them. I think that's just about all the time we have this evening. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and will you please join me in thanking Dr. Gay Scalthorpe.